Hi, everyone. Um, uh, today, I have a very special guest. Uh, I'm chatting with uh, Chloe Cole, who's with me from uh, California. And um, Chloe's, I've been Chloe following Chloe for a, a fair while now on Twitter and her story. Um, one of the things that's happened in Victoria over the last few years, Chloe, is um, we've had these new laws in 2021, which they called them change and suppression laws. But one of the things that they've done is um, made it illegal to for uh, uh, gender treatments to do anything other than affirmation only mm. in Victoria. And that was my... That was the first time I'd really been involved with this uh, issue at all. I consulted very widely on it because I was I was very concerned about what they're doing. Um, I ended up opposing it, but it passed anyway. And that was the first time where I'd met with people who called themselves uh, detransitioners. So, for those of you at home who don't know what that is, it's someone who has undergone some form of um, gender transition and then decided to de detransition. Um, now, more recently, I've become even more concerned about some of these issues. Um, we've been looking into like some of these gender treatments for for children, and I've been very concerned about some of the some of the things that, well, some of the transparency about what's been happening in Victoria. We don't really have a good handle on it. But back in 2021, also in Victoria, there was a massive jump of the number of children presenting with gender dysphoria. And this is in the middle of lockdowns during COVID and everything. And it actually doubled in a year in one clinic. And I, I don't know the reasons for that, but I find it very alarming and concerning. But um, yeah, but um, Chloe, um, thank you again so much for, for speaking with me. Um, for those people in uh, Victoria who don't know anything about you, um, like what what what's happened? What's your story, and um, what's been happening in the U.S. at the moment? Right. So, for about a year now, I've been speaking about my experience of having transitioned both socially and medically as a minor. I'm a biological female, but at around the age of twelve, I started feeling that I wasn't actually a girl, and that I should start living in the identity of the opposite sex. And so I started identifying as a boy and I changed my name to Leo. And so I started to change the way that, say like I cut my hair or the clothing that I wore and eventually started telling some of my friends at school and my family that I wanted to be a boy, that I wanted to be their son, their, their brother, their nephew their grandson, and not their daughter. Um, and eventually, I started medically transitioning at the age of 13, meaning that, um, well, for me, the way it went was that I started on a medication called Lupron to suppress my puberty. And a month after that, I was put on testosterone. And after my sophomore year of high school, I don't know what the Australian equivalent is, but I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. I underwent a double mastectomy and my breasts were permanently removed. But I stopped transitioning about a year later when I was 16 years old because I realized that I really wanted to embrace my identity as a woman and eventually become a mother one day and that these treatments that I was on could, could hinder my ability to, to have to naturally mother children. And it was something, this was a revelation that was really deeply heartbreaking for me. And the journey back from trying to transition into a boy was very difficult. And I lost a lot of my friends. I lost my connections with the trans community and I was ostracized by them. And I've spent, I've since been trying to pick up the pieces of my life and trying to help other people who are in a situation quite like mine, especially other people who transition as kids. Yeah, and, and how old are you now, Chloe? I'm 18. Yeah, and like, it's, um, I've, I've been contacted by lots of parents who have concerns um, of varying levels um, with with what's been happening to their kids. Um, 
and many of them are concerned about you know making a mistake with this of course you would be as a as a as a parent um right what 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 was it that made you originally start to think that you're a boy and then uh, at, there must have been some point where you decided that that was a mistake and you, and you went back back to, back to being being a woman um I mean, there were a lot of things that made me think that I wasn't a girl. Um, from a young age, I was kind of a bit of a tomboy, more so as I started to get older, and especially as I hit puberty, I started liking cutting my hair shorter. And just, I always felt like I connected more with the boys, especially in terms of like my interests, um, my sense of humor, and um, like my personality. And there were a lot of ways that I felt like I was inadequate compared to other women. I felt like I wasn't pretty and that I would never make a good woman because of that. And I had body image issues, which I kind of attribute to having gone started puberty at a pretty young age. I was about nine years old when I started visibly developing breasts. And it was a very uncomfortable time for me. And... It was very difficult dealing with just knowing that now adults and boys and everybody around me is going to start seeing me differently as a woman instead of a girl. And that sort of adjustment, especially at such an early age, as well as my early social media and internet use. Um, I got my first phone when I was about 11 years old. And very quickly afterward, I started using social media, like, uh, like apps like Instagram and Snapchat. And a lot, of, a lot of the content that was presented to me was very, much of it was very sexual in nature. And a lot of it was young women who were portrayed in a sexual manner or they had a very specific body type that I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't match up to because I was pretty young. I was only a few years into puberty. But like I was, I was kind of on the skinny side and I wasn't particularly developed in my chest or my hips. And I thought that because I couldn't match this image that my life as a woman was over as I knew it. Wow. Um, but and, this hmm. idea that I was actually not my birth sex didn't really come along naturally. Um, it was only until after I started using social media that I learned that I could make the choice. I didn't just because I was born as a biological woman didn't necessarily didn't necessarily didn't necessarily mean that I actually had to be a woman that it could be possible that I had like the the brain of a boy and that might explain why I was so boyish why I connected with the boys more and why I felt more like my my dad and my big brothers than my mom and my big sisters mm. I, I've heard this from a from a number of people um in particular uh, uh, girls, parents with with girls who they're concerned that, um, like you say, it's being presented as a choice. And for some for some young girls facing puberty, it's always been like a challenging time for them. And uh, it's been put to me that uh, some girls see this as a way of avoiding all that mm. and, and 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 bypassing it. Do, do you do you think that's a common thing? Oh yeah, I mean these are pretty these are pretty normal. These these feelings are pretty normal for mm. women growing up. I mean there's a lot of girls who start out as tomboys and most girls don't feel comfortable in their bodies, especially when I mean I think kids are starting starting puberty younger and younger, especially girls. And so all these different social expectations and just the the changes in their bodies are so difficult to deal with at such a young age. Mm. But it's not anything that they couldn't get through. We're just not giving kids the tools, the strength that they need to get through these normal parts of development. Um, I mean, I was, my mom would sometimes tell me growing up, like, oh, I was, I was a tomboy like you too. But it still felt like there was something that, just felt off about me like I knew other girls who were tomboys 
but even then I felt like there was something that was setting me apart from them. And I think that was because I'm, I haven't, I've, I've tried to get diagnosis before, but I believe that I'm on the autism spectrum, but each time that I, um, each, with each screening that I had, I was just told like, well, you're very, you're very intelligent. So you're probably not on the spectrum, which doesn't make sense because most kids, especially on the high functioning end of the spectrum, are more intelligent on average mm. than most of their peers. Um, and I didn't really feel like I had any strong female role models growing up, anybody, any, any women that I could really model myself after. And like, it, I don't really have any hard feelings towards like my mom or my older sisters, but I just wasn't very close to them growing up. And I think part of that is like the, um, like the age gap between me and the rest of my siblings. So I'm about like seven to eight years older, no, younger than the rest of them. And so I wasn't super close to them growing up. And I often heard about like all the the scary things about growing up from a girl into a woman, like having to have periods every month and dealing with blood coming out of your own body and the cramps and the emotional dysregulation and the possibility of things like, like getting pregnant and then going through childbirth and all the pain that comes with that. Nobody ever presented it in a light that was like, well, I mean, all this is a blessing. Like there is, through all the pain, there is a good thing that comes out of this. And that is the gift of life. And even if you don't want to have kids one day, it's still wonderful that we can do that just using our own bodies and that we can nourish our children using them. I always heard about the negative things that being a woman brought, and I often felt like the, the, the grass would always be greener on the other side, that men have, had it better in every single way, that their bodies didn't make their lives a living hell, and that socially they had it better, and that they had more fun, and that they were smarter and stronger, and that as long as I was a woman, I would never be able to compare to a man or a boy. Wow. Um, a, a lot of people um, watching this wouldn't know what um, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and, and um, you know, top surgery and things like this are. Um, can you explain, like, what, what puberty blockers actually are and, and like, um, what, what are the effects of taking them? Um, so the medication that I took was called Lupron. And I don't know the exact mechanism, but it works by restricting the um, the production of the sex hormones in the body, and that includes testosterone, estrogen, and I think um, LH and fol follicle stimulating hormones. Um, and since I was already started starting puberty it sort of created like a state of menopause for me so at the at the very beginning of the treatment about two weeks in i got a very heavy period and then my menses stopped and after that i started to become lethargic and i started experiencing actual like menopausal symptoms such as like hot flashes like for me um I mean, even on the coldest of days during the winter time, it was really uncomfortable because I would have like these sudden flare ups of just my entire body would get hot and itchy. And it was really difficult for me to deal with. I mean, these are these are things that usually women in like their late 40s to early 60s start to experience as they hit menopause. And I was experiencing all of this as a 13 year old girl. Wow. And then. Uh, you said, I think, was it a couple of years later, you started cross-sex hormones? Um, it was about a month after I started on the the puberty blockers. Right. So the effect is that it's stopping the natural production of hormones during puberty. Yeah. 
and then artificially uh, providing male hormones. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Um, the way they explained it to me was that they were just like trying to get rid of the natural like production of sex hormones in my body to make way for the new exogenous male hormones. And at the time, that wasn't what the standard procedure was supposed to be. Um, it was supposed to be about like a waiting period, I think, between starting any physical treatments just to determine whether these feelings would persist or if I would desist from identifying as transgender and go on to live as my, my birth sex, living in my birth identity. But, and also to um, start on the blockers and then, I don't know what the exact amount of time would be, but just just to they say that it's supposed to be like a like a pause to allow children to make the decision of whether they want to go through their own natural puberty or to start transitioning to the opposite sex which that in itself doesn't make sense either because if a child isn't developing physically or psychologically then they're not going through the development necessary to be able to make an informed decision on something like that. And you can't just stop puberty. You can't just stop a natural, necessary, healthy part of development because there will be consequences. And there certainly, there certainly have been for me. I mean, all of the complications that I suffered while I was on it, like the menopausal symptoms, and they stopped as I went off of the puberty blockers, but now a few years later, I'm getting like um, I get I get aches and pains in my joints, mainly like in my my limbs and my hands and my fingers. But I also get back pains as well, and occasionally I even get like shooting pains up my back. And what's the and I mean, Lupron is known for leading complications with like um like bone loss and osteoporosis. And it was actually, before it was used to treat children with gender dysphoria, it has been used in like late stage prostate and breast cancer patients and even like juvenile sex offenders. And in these sex offenders, it was actually, it was deemed to be too cruel for use in these criminals. So it's, I don't know how we determined that it's not too cruel for use in children with gender dysphoria. Mm. And, and what's been the, the, like the health consequences for you of undergoing these treatments? Um, I mean, from all three, from the blockers and the testosterone, and even the surgery, I've had some pretty serious complications. Most of them weren't even, most of the ones that I'm experiencing today aren't even, they weren't even listed on the forms for them. Um, the testosterone, um, while I was on it, I started to experience issues with my urinary tract. Like I started getting um, frequent UTIs, and at one point it got so bad that I was even getting like clots of blood and cloudy urine and even like bits of tissue in my urine. Wow. And it's, it's since gone away, but I, I've, I've tried to get like an appointment to determine what the cause of it was. And each time I got a response that was too late for my doctors or they just determine like, oh, it's just a, it's just a UTI. Like, we'll give you this, this medication. We'll give you, we'll give you antibiotics or we'll diagnose you over the phone with a condition that you may or may not have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I haven't really gotten an answer on why, what any of that was, but I think that it was actually from the atrophy that testosterone caused in the pelvic region of my body. And um, I remember in one of the appointments for my testosterone, um, 
when my endocrinologist was discussing some of the, the possible side effects from these procedures, um, she told me like, well, you, you might experience atrophy in your vagina. And the way it was explained to me was like, um, it's going to thin out the tissue and this might cause like pain, discomfort and dryness. And it was described in like a lot of the other potential side effects of these procedures in very vague terms. I guess to kind of water it down for a 13 year old, but this is not something that you can water down because I, I didn't know this until afterward, but this, until after I stopped these treatments, but this atrophy actually spreads to the rest of the reproductive system. It affects the reproductive system as a whole, and it can actually affect other organs in the pelvic region that are not necessarily a part of that system, which for me, um, I was unlucky. And it, it ended up affecting my urinary tract as well. And I was told like, well, you can just take like a estrogen suppository down the line to treat the, the, um, the atrophy. And eventually I did because it was giving, it was, um, I was getting like really bad, um, your, not urinary pains, but uterine pains, which were worse than any period I had ever had. But I wasn't sexually active yet, and I was being allowed to make a decision on these things that would affect things like my sexual function and my reproductive, my reproductive function as well. Like, I, I was also told by my endocrinologist, like, you might not be able to have kids after starting this treatment or it might, it might become more, more difficult. But this didn't really mean anything to me at the time because I was, I was 13. I was still a child. And I naively thought, though reproductive um, preservation was not once presented as an option to me, I knew that there were things like IVF or surrogacy. And I naively thought, like, well, I could probably, even if I have problems with uh, with naturally conceiving a child down the line as an adult, well, I could probably just go through one of those treatments, right? Like, it's just that easy, right? I didn't understand that those procedures are very intense on the body. And that it's just, it's not that easy and doesn't always work out. Yes. And from the surgery... Um, well, obviously, I'll, I'll never be able to breastfeed. And that was a big point of pain for me when I first I first started realizing that I regretted my transition because I even though I was told like I'd never be able to breastfeed, I didn't really know what exactly that entailed. Like I just thought like, I mean, I was living in the mindset of, of, of being a boy who would soon become a man. And I thought like, Men and fathers don't breastfeed their children. I don't really know why. I, I don't really see that as pertinent to me. Like, I could, I'm, I could just use, like, formula or donor milk. Um, it was only a year after my surgery that I was taking, like, a class in psychology. And there was, like, a section that was focusing on, like, parenting and especially, like, motherhood. And... Like there was a part of the lesson that taught about like how um, how breastfeeding plays a role in a child's development because it it reinforces that sort of loving bond between a mother and her infant, and there's a lot of benefits to breastfeeding your children that I didn't know about before, mm. including like um, like breast milk has a lot of like a a lot of um, a lot of nutrients like probiotics that can help your, your baby build like their their immune system and their brain and yeah. i i wasn't informed of any of this i didn't know why breastfeeding was so special or i mean when when i first started on testosterone and puberty blockers i didn't know yet that there was such thing as a cervix or that there were four stages in the menstrual cycle 
and nobody, none of the doctors really made a point of explaining these things to me and making sure that I fully understood what any of this meant. Mm. And now they, they also, they not only took like my, they not only incised into my breast and took out the breast tissue, they also, um, they made skin grafts out of my areolas to, to repos reposition them in a more masculine position, they said. Um, and at first, these skin grafts seem to be seem to be healing fairly well, but um, about two years post op, um, in early summer of last year, they started to leak fluid, and I don't really have any idea what this is. I've tried to go back to my surgeon to try to get like an exam, try to get like an examination, and he just all I could get with him was like a five minute Zoom call, and the whole time he was quite. He was quite dismissive of my concerns, and his advice to deal with this was just to to put Vaseline on it, which it didn't really make sense to me because it's already emitting fluid. But I assumed that as a surgeon, he might have seen a case like mine before, and so I decided that I would take his advice, and it might work out. And it actually made it worse. It made it gave me a skin infection. And since then, I've just been having to start bandaging my chest every day, and I don't really have any answers. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for sharing that. It must be, must be um, quite, quite difficult. Um, now, you've decided at some stage to speak out about this. You've become... Um, Quite quite a well known figure in the US. Um, what's what motivated you to speak out about this? Like, what are your feelings on these treatments for children now? It's not ever okay for use in children, ever. I mean, transition. Now it's pretty pretty much being presented as a one size fits all option. For all patients with gender dysphoria, they're being told that they actually are the opposite sex and that their only option really is to start transitioning. It's never suggested that they should they should wait to determine whether this is really the path that they want to go on, nor are they being given the information on these procedures or on transitioning as a whole that they need. I mean, one of the arguments that trans activists use is that the younger you transition, the better, because then less of the secondary sex characteristics that make people, that might make a patient dysphoric, won't pop up, and so they won't experience gender dysphoria from those features. But it doesn't really take into account just how dangerous transitioning while you're young, especially while you're still developing and either pubescent or prepubescent is because you're also missing out on some pretty crucial development, both in like your brain and other parts of your body, and especially the reproductive system. It's not, puberty is not just something that you can skip out on. It's a necessary function of the body. And it's very often that these feelings are concurrent with and likely being caused by some other comorbid issue. Um, a lot of these patients who are presenting with gender dysphoria have some sort of trauma, either having to do with like their family, like either they have been verbally or physically abused, or they're neglected, or they're in the foster care system where they have some sort of um, attachment issue with their caregivers. Or they have abuse, they have a history of having been sexually abused or assaulted or raped, especially in childhood. And it's not hard to see why, say, having one parent being out of the picture or not being a very strong role model or having been sexually assaulted 
might make you not want to associate with your own sex. And there are a lot of other common comorbid conditions such as, well, the most common one I can think of is autism and other learning disorders such as ADHD, as well as like depression and social anxiety and cluster B personality disorders. And none of these are almost ever taken into account during the diagnosis or treatment process. It's often either treated as issues that are standalone and having absolutely nothing to do with the gender dysphoria, or they even say sometimes that, say like if, if, if a patient is experiencing depression or they're afraid to socialize with other people, that it's directly caused by their disconnect with their body and that the only treatment they they have is transitioning and um you said before about um so just to clarify your your view on this is that these treatments shouldn't be used on children at all not ever yep it's, and it's going to interfere with every single part of a child's development Socially, emotionally, physically, sexually, and with the reproductive system, with the reproductive function. It's going, the earlier you start these treatments, and after a certain point of being on hormones or blockers, or once a person has underwent sex reassignment surgery and had their gonads removed, they're, now they're going to be able to naturally produce their own sex hormones nor are they going to be able to have children of their own. And it's cruel to have children make a decision that will affect that before they know just how important that might be to them. Yeah, and this has been one of my big concerns as well, that the, the concept of consent, that um, these treatments are a lifelong thing, and uh, I have concerns whether children really have the ability to make that decision at, at that stage in their in their life and as, it as takes you, a lot of lived experience yeah yeah and children don't know about things like you know um breastfeeding and things like this of course they don't they, they don't uh, it's not something that you know, comes to their mind i suppose and um you mentioned before about the reaction of so the trans community and trans rights activists um to you speaking out like what how have how have the, how have you been treated by these people i mean from the very beginning even while i was transitioning sometimes i would get like into little spats with other people within the community just because my views didn't align with theirs like at the beginning at the beginning of my transition i was actually a little more conservative leaning but sometimes like when i was talking about like my just my own personal opinions I would get attacked by other trans people and I would be shamed even for having these beliefs. And eventually, after some time, I started to conform a little bit more and take on more of the more common views within the trans community. Um, it's kind of a hive mind, really. It's, mm. it's really disturbing. But once I started talking about like my transition regret and like the all the trauma that I'd been to and how much I hated how the mastectomy and testosterone made me look and that feeling of having been used and lied to by my own doctors, I got attacked pretty quickly. Like I I had people going after me telling me like you should be ashamed of yourself like you're imposing your your experiences on other transgender people and making it so that they might not seek out the treatment that they need as real transgender people um and sometimes they would get outright just cruel like uh, there was there was one person who told me like um like doesn't it hurt like you you should have known exactly what you're doing to yourself um, the phrase they used, I think, was something along the lines of, you were 13, not three. You weren't a toddler. I knew exactly what I wanted when I was 13 years old. And 
basically I was just, I was told to shut up because I was making everybody else in the community uncomfortable and preventing them from getting the services and treatments that they need. I, I was even told at one point that I didn't deserve such a loving family and community around me or, or doctors who would have helped me mm. and that I was taking away resources from the community and having transitioned and doing what, what I thought was best for me and the only, taking the only option that was really given to me. And what? And a lot of these same people actually encouraged me to trend. Well, not exactly encouraged me, but after like starting on testosterone, and especially after I had my surgery, they celebrated all of this. And I saw more and more celebration from the community and from people who call themselves allies, the more extreme the treatment got. Like, after I had the mastectomy, I, I don't think I'd ever gotten that much praise in my life before that point. Like, maybe except for, like, my, my mom or dad or older siblings or my classmates or teachers telling me, like, wow, you draw really well. I mean, that's really about the extent of it mm. before that point in time. Yeah, right. And, um... What, what about the the doctors that gave you these treatments? What are your views on these these doctors and, um, you know, what they've done, their role in all of this? Do you think that they were doing it for the right reasons and made good decisions? Um, I mean, I think some of them were just going by the protocol and they thought that they were helping. But... I also believe that it could have been financially motivated because especially for the pharmaceutical industry, transitioning is very lucrative with all of the, um, well, first starting with puberty suppressants and then cross sex hormones. And then down the line, you start to see some complications from both of those treatments. So you have to, you have to, you have to prescribe more and more, more and more medication in higher doses and then eventually the surgeons profit off of this and the surgeries are probably the most lucrative out of all these treatments i mean upwards of several dozen thousand dollars to um i mean for the facial feminization treatments for um for for biological males who are transitioning to a male identity, to a female identity, um, depending on how many features they change in their face, it could be up to like, well, I, I don't know the exact figures, but in some cases I've heard like anywhere between like 30,000 to 50,000. I think an average mastectomy is between like, um, like 5,000 to about, about $30,000. Right. And... I mean, in my state, in California, if you against if you go against the affirmative care model, if you don't affirm your patients and you instead tell them like, well, maybe these feelings aren't valid. Maybe it's stemming from some other issue. Maybe you're not actually the opposite sex and you have some sort of trauma that's making you trying to escape from your own body and your identity as the sex that you are, that's considered conversion therapy. Yeah. And we have the same sort of laws in Victoria now as of 2021. So that's actually, um, that's outlawed in California as well, is it? Yes. So a doctor or a therapist can't have that sort of conversation. We have the same problem here. And um, that was why I opposed it back in 2021 because I was concerned that maybe people should be having that conversation and asking questions, especially with young children. Um, they absolutely should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, yeah, you, when did that law come into effect in California? Is that a fairly recent thing? Um, I believe so. I'm not exactly sure which year it was, but 
I mean, it kind of just goes to show that I always failed on a systemic level. Like, it's illegal to have given me the help that I needed. Hmm. And the standards of care, well, my my doctors at the time weren't really following them anyways, but now it's become that there aren't really any age restrictions on these treatments anymore, according to the World Professional Organization, the the W path hmm. that handles the that's the organization that handles the um the worldwide um guidelines on these procedures. Hmm. And what would you say to a child that was in your position back when you were 12 years old? What would you what would you say to a child in that position who had those feelings similar to what you had at that age? Um I mean if I were to speak to another dysphoric child, I would I would tell them that though it might seem like this is the only option for treating these feelings, it's not, it's not the only way out. And if anything, it's very likely that it's going to make your life a lot more difficult. Socially, emotionally, um, and for your health as well, it's going to cause a lot of issues with your physical and sexual and reproductive health down the line. And as a child, you might not be able to understand, to fully appreciate all the damages yet. And that's exactly why you shouldn't be making decisions like that. And it takes a lot of introspection to know whether these feelings might be accompanied by some previous traumas or stressors in your life, or if it might be caused by other conditions like um like having like being autistic it it takes a lot of lived experience and years and knowledge of the world to make such a life-changing decision that most children under the age of 18 and even under the age of 25 just aren't able to have and the issue really isn't your own body. There is no such thing as being born in the wrong body. It's the way that you feel about it. And what would you say to, uh, to politicians, so people like me, about what we should be doing? What do you think needs to happen here? Um, I know that we have, you know, different laws in Australia and California, but clearly some similarities as well. Um, what what do we need to do to um, to help here? Childhood transition needs to be outlawed completely, with absolutely no exceptions, because this is never appropriate for children ever. It's a permanent physical treatment for a psychiatric problem. And it needs to be stopped. But if we're going to get rid of it, we also need to implement another option for kids who are having, who are experiencing gender dysphoria. Mm. They need psychotherapy, not their puberty blocked, not cross-sex hormones, not sex reassignment surgery. They need tender loving care. They need to understand that they're they're to be loved, that they're okay, just the way they are. And they need help dealing with the underlying causes of these feelings. And for the kids and adults who have already been through these procedures, they need help as well. I mean, there isn't really any standard of care for people like me, for detransitioners, for people who have been on these treatments and regret them and are trying to go off of them and are having whole bunch of complications and health issues arising from having been through them. Um, and the standard of care in general for patients, both adults and of children, needs to be overhauled completely because transition is pretty much being 
considered as the only option for these patients. It's very one size fits all. But I think that's something that has to be done through medical boards rather than through legislation. And um, also with this uh, affirmation only laws that um, we have in Victoria and also California, you were saying, um, do you think these sorts of laws should be repealed? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, neither me nor my parents or even my doctors were given any other option. So mm. it was pretty much impossible for me to get the appropriate care that I actually needed. Mm. It would have been And elite. oftentimes these kids are just, they're gender non-conforming. They're, they're tomboys, they're effeminate boys. Many of them are, are gay and lesbian and have been bullied or abused for the sexual orientation, or they've been through some serious sexual trauma. And it's cruel to put them on this path and to not consider any of that in the treatment or the diagnostic process. Mm. Absolutely. And um, uh, going forward, um, you know, like if people want to um, follow what you're doing um, and, and see what, you know, what, what you're doing at the moment, um, is the best place to do that on Twitter, your account on Twitter? Yeah, so my, I'm, I'm mainly active on Twitter, um, but I also use Instagram and YouTube. And I actually just recently interviewed another girl my age who, she only lives about 30 minutes away from me. Yeah. Um, we live, we live in this, in this, in pretty much the same area. And we even saw some of the same doctors and she transitioned about a year younger than I did. And she, she started testosterone at 12 years old and she underwent a double mastectomy when she was 15, when she was 13 years old, when wow. she was barely a preteen. And I recently just released that on my YouTube. I don't mean to shamelessly promote myself, but no, no, it's, by all means. it's a pretty, it's a pretty good interview. And she has a really important perspective on this. Yeah, look, and a, a lot of people that um, follow me on social media are really interested in this issue now because it's so topical. And um, I'm, I'm sure many of them, I'll put uh, links to um, your social media accounts in, in the comments when, when this goes up. But um, look, um, thank you so much for, for your courage and bravery in speaking out on this. And, and thank you so much for talking with me. And, and I'm sure... Um, many, many Victorians will be um, very grateful to hear your perspective on all of this, what's happening. And um, I wish you all the best in whatever you choose to do in the future. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate you giving, giving me this platform and this time to talk about my own experiences and just for being so respectful about it. Thank you.